Okay, um, so I'll just start by introducing myself. I'm Vered, I'm a postdoc at uh, AI2 and uh, the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and I'm working on NLP and more specifically on common sense reasoning. Um, and uh, this, uh, these slides are going to be based on the ACL tutorial on common sense reasoning that I um, gave in the beginning of the month with my colleagues, uh, Yejin, Martin, Antoine, and Dan. Um, so uh, many of the slides are um, their slides. And um, I'm not gonna cover everything that we covered in the tutorial because it was uh, longer, uh, but the recordings of the tutorial and all the slides are available on um, this website. So you're uh, welcome to check it out. So um, if you follow popular media, then you uh, might think uh, that uh, many AI tasks are already solved. Um, so starting with um, five years ago, there was superhuman performance on object recognition and on uh, image captioning. And then uh, in 2016, Google uh, uh, released their um, neural machine translation uh, models. Um, and maybe like me, you've, all, you've also noticed that some of the, the translation uh, from, for some language pairs have uh, really improved. Uh, and then in 2017, there was um, super human performance on speech recognition. And um, uh, then two years ago, there was um, super human performance on reading comprehension or specifically on the squad data set. Um, so from all of these, and I don't think that's, that's what you think, but people outside the field that um, follow popular media might think that uh, we've already solved AI. Uh, but in practice, this is not what's happening, and uh, there is growing evidence that um, our models are not actually learning to solve the tasks, and that you can really easily trick them with uh, any input that's slightly different from the distribution it was trained on. So, for example, um, you can uh, add some random noise to, um, to an image that humans wouldn't be able to notice, but the models um, would, would uh, be confused and predict a different object or um, in visual question answering, uh, the models just learn to answer any, how many question with uh, two, which is uh, what, they've, um, what they've observed in the training set. Um, in, and anything that is um, outside of its natural environment also confuses the model. In text, um, dialogue systems sometimes answer really strange questions, like for a very trivial question, like, how are you? They might answer something like, I don't know. Um, and in text generation, there is a, a repetition problem. So you probably, um, you can see very easily on the phone, even though I think it's um, not, neural, not neural models, but um, when you start typing, you can, you get into, sometimes you get into a loop and uh, in um, machine comprehension, you also, it's very easy to confuse the model if you have a passage and a question uh, who, whose answer should be in the passage uh, by adding a sentence to the passage that discusses a completely different uh, topic, but with a named entity of the same type that's expected to, um, for the answer. Uh, the model often predicts the, the named entity in the last sentence, the unrelated one. Um, so all of these um, and, and many other uh, work in, in, in NLP and in other machine learning um, fields uh, shows that we're not actually um, solving the tasks. We're just solving specific data sets and often by just training models that learn to pick up the very shallow patterns um, that are only indicative of the specific uh, distribution of the data set and not of the task itself. Um, there's, I've seen several times this year, um, AI people um, making this analogy to um, Daniel Kahneman's um, System 1 and System 2. This is from uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. So uh, it's originally about people, how people uh, reason, uh, but you could also, um, you could also try to um, talk about machine learning in that, in, in this uh, uh, terminology. So. System one reasoning is fast, uh, intuitive, um, uh, more like pattern matching things that we're, we're doing uh, unconsciously. 
while system two reasoning is uh, slow and logical and uh, takes effort. So uh, we can say that right now, uh, deep learning is very good in system one tasks in recognizing patterns, uh, but it's not doing any kind of system, almost any kind of system two uh, uh, rational thinking. And we would like to bridge this gap. Um, there's also another, um, this is, uh, um, th there's also something about uh, three cognitive systems uh, in which uh, an additional cognitive system is perception. And that's where um, object recognition, image segmentation and speech recognition uh, could, be, um, could be categorized. Um, and um, for intuition, intuition, you can uh, have things like, that are very easy for us, like thinking of preconditions and post conditions of some given event or um, temporal reasoning like what, ha what happens before and after things, or maybe reasoning about the mental states of other people, like what, what do people want? Why do they do the things they do and so on? And this is something we do effortlessly all the time. Uh, while um, system two reasoning is um, things that require um, require effort like solving puzzles or um, coding or writing or reviewing papers and so on. And this is something that many people um, often spend hours or, or days not doing at all. And we can argue that our uh, machine learning models are somewhere here, maybe um, good at perception, uh, but are um, maybe in the beginning of having some kind of intuition. Um, so um, I have to define common sense for the uh, sake of this meetup and it's not very easy to define, but we're, we're gonna go according to the following definition. Uh, this is the basic level of practical knowledge and reasoning uh, concerning everyday situations and events that are commonly shared among most people. Um, so it's easy to exemplify it um, with something like, um, we know that it's okay to keep the closet door open, but it's not okay to keep the fridge door open because there's food inside it and it might go bad. Um, and this is something that as humans, we, it's essential for us to live uh, and interact with each other in a reasonable and safe way. And for um, AI, it's essential in order to eventually understand human needs and actions better. Um, there was a lot of work on common sense reasoning uh, in the early AI in the 70s and 80s, um, but it's, I think it failed, I mean, um, failed pretty badly. Uh, and it's not really conclusive on why it failed, but um, there could be several reasons or probably a combination of the following reasons. So it's either a weak computing power or not enough data, uh, weaker computational models, and maybe also uh, the conceptualization wasn't uh, good enough. Um, but so, so today we have different tools and we can uh, try to target common sense reasoning again. Um, so what, what would be the path to common sense reasoning? Is it just, um, you know, brute forcing larger networks with deeper layers? Uh, probably not because uh, you can't reach the moon with uh, by making the tallest building in the world taller. Uh, so it's going to take some some different approaches. Uh, and specifically, what we're going to cover today is going to be um, symbolic common sense graphs, neural common sense representations, reasoning engine with common sense, and constructing um, challenge data sets. Right, so we can track our track our progress. Um, so we're going to start by talking, talking about um, the pre-trained language models. This is the, um, the most uh, used tool right, tool right now in uh, NLP. Uh, so we're going to see what kind of knowledge is already captured by these models. Uh, then we're going to talk about common sense benchmarks. How do we measure progress on common sense reasoning? Um, then uh, talking about um, how to collect and use uh, resources for uh, common sense knowledge, and finally how to integrate them into neural models. So we're going to start by pre-trained language models, and I I don't know how uh, how much how familiar uh, all of you are with uh, um, with uh, language models or with NLP, uh, but in the last two years, this is the the main paradigm, paradigm um, that, we, that, that we train models on top of these pre-trained language models. Um, they're all 
almost all of them except for the GPT models are, are for some reason named after um, Sesame Street characters. Um, and they capture a lot of knowledge. We're going to talk about it. Um, it's going to be of several types of common sense knowledge. So it could be either uh, physical common sense, like if you if uh, you lean on someone, then maybe your back hurts less than if you're standing. Um, f uh, social common sense and um, other things that just that could be just be uh, defined as common sense, like cookies are tasty. Um, Okay, so just to be on the same page, uh, pre-trained language models are um, very large machine learning models that are self-supervised um, by uh, just uh, training on a very large corpus of text. Um, traditionally, language models are trained to predict the next word in the sequence. So for example, um, for a sequence like parrots are among the most intelligent birds, and the ability of some species to imitate human speech enhances their popularity as, um, so the model needs to predict paths. Uh, and um, in the last two years, the um, following Google's uh, BERT model, uh, there are also mass language models um, whose objective are slightly different. So instead of predicting the next word in the sequence, uh, any word in the sequence could just be masked and the model needs to predict it with, from its uh, both from its left and right context. So here, for example, if we mask birds, the model needs to predict birds. Uh, this is what happens during the uh, pre-training. And um, typically what you would do afterwards is um, you would also fine tune the model on some specific data set to perform a specific task. Um, so that uh, what you would do is you would just put a classifier on top of it uh, or some other model and you, um, you back propagate the task specific loss to update the, the uh, representation itself. Um, what the underlying uh, architecture for all these language models uh, is the transformer model from Google. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much into it, but um, in general, um, every uh, word in the sequence is represented by uh, attending to um, many layers uh, representing another word, uh, all the other words. Uh, so it's a contextualized representation. Um, so the first question we're asking is whether uh, these pre-trained language models already capture common sense knowledge. Um, and by already capture, I mean just like using them out of the box, not fine tuning them for any specific task. Um, so one way to answer this question is through a common sense knowledge based completion. Uh, and so there were two papers last year, one from Petroni et al. and the other one from Feldman et al. Um, that used pre-trained language models, specifically um, Elmo and Bert, uh, to try to complete um, common sense knowledge base, specifically concept net. We're going to talk about it a lot later. Uh, and the way that they do that is that um, they just convert every um, triplet in the knowledge base uh, into some uh, or every relation in the knowledge base into ha handcrafted uh, natural language templates. So um, the example on the left here is not actually common sense knowledge. I think it's from uh, their Wikidata experiment, but just to uh, just to uh, illustrate um, a triplet like Dante born in X can be um, converted into Dante was born in mask. And then they just use BERT to um, query for substitute of the mask and they get something like Florence. Uh, or this could also be used to score triplets if you assign words into them. Uh, the other paper from Feldman et al, um, they, they had several uh, templates for each relation and they use GPT-2 to score these, um, these statements. Um, mostly I think just to find the most grammatical one or the most plausible one. So for example, um, a musician can play a musical instrument is a better uh, statement than musician can playing musical instrument. Um, so overall, um, these two papers had pretty positive results, um, but with caveats. So one of them stated that it's mostly um, performing well on, uh, on questions that have a single answer more like encyclopedic knowledge. Um, but when, when you ask it things that are in many to many relations, then it uh, performs worse. And the other paper um, 
uh, showed that it's, it doesn't perform as well as supervised methods, which is kind of expected, uh, but that it, it's more robust. So they, they can um, then, uh, they then apply it to um, just mining knowledge from Wikipedia and, um, and, and they get new uh, accurate knowledge that they um, let humans uh, evaluate it and it, it's pretty accurate. So overall, it's, uh, the results are pretty positive. Um, in another paper from Weird Al, um, they uh, looked at the, these models' ability to recognize or associate concept with their properties. So um, they, they ask two main questions. One of them is whether, um, given the properties, the language model can identify the concept. So this is uh, sort of like a 20 question game, but they, they do it with 10 uh, properties. So starting with a single property, they, they have a sentence like uh, something has fur um, and they use Bert and Roberta. Uh, these are the two mass language models to complete this sentence and they get the following animals. This is just an illustration of the animals they had in their paper. Um, and then they gradually add more properties. So now it's also big and it has claws. And so it eliminates some of the concepts. And continuing like this until um, uh, either they guess a single concept or, um, well, until they have 10 properties. Um, so what they found is that they have pretty good performance, uh, specifically Roberta performs better than Bert. Um, this is going to be a repeating conclusion because, um, well, because Roberta is, is by design uh, the um, improved version of BERT. Um, they also uh, not, um, noted that it works much better on kind of encyclopedic or functional knowledge uh, than things that are more perceptual, like visual knowledge. And this is also going to be a conclusion that we're going to see again in another paper uh, and this mostly happens because these models learn from text and some things are just not um, very often mentioned in text because we, um, we use other modalities, we uh, use our vision. So some things are just, you don't need to describe them because people, people see them. And can, can, we, can, can we ask a question here? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, um, this is kind of expected, right? I mean, Bert was trained on Wikipedia and uh, you are testing it on encyclopedic knowledge. So it's like yeah. you're discovering the will because uh, in Wikipedia, you have all this knowledge. Well, I, I agree. I mean, I agree that the training corpus really matters uh, and that um, you won't be able maybe to extract the exact, exact same knowledge if you trained it on fiction, for example. Um, you can really easily see the differences if you use different language models to generate or to complete sentences. Uh, but it's still, um, it's still uh, not trivial because um, the models are not expected to memorize everything. And since they're trained in like a very, it's like a distributional model. So, so it's learning some kind of distribution. So it sometimes makes mistakes. Uh, I'm actually, I have a slide on it in, in a few, um, a few slides. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you that it's not trivial to predict the correct answer, even if it observed it in the corpus. Yeah, I would also like to see the slides. I actually also have a question about what is the definition of concept? Because here from this example, I get that it means some sort of uh, taxonomy tree or, or semantic tree. Um, yeah. Is that what it is? Um, yeah, so in this specific paper, they, they use the data set called McRae norms, uh, which can, consists of, um, it's, it's pretty small, so it doesn't consist of many concepts, but usually it would refer to something that can appear in a taxonomy or um, like, yeah, so something, I, I don't know how else to describe concept, but yeah, anything that is um, uh, either some kind of entity, it doesn't have to be a named entity, but um, yeah. So in, in McRae, they, they use basic level concepts and let people um, list the properties of those concepts. Right. Yeah. So you, you would say the dog is an animal and has four legs and this kind of stuff. So it's, it's pretty exactly. small. Uh, it's one yeah, it is. Thousand it's and something concepts, yes. Yeah. Wow. And, and it, 
it's okay for the sake of this paper because they're only using it for evaluation. So they only want to test whether um, these models in general can associate concepts with their properties. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move to the next experiment in this paper. Um, so here they're trying the other direction. So um, uh, giving the model some concept and asking it to list its properties. Um, and, and here they are comparing it with a uh, human elicited properties. So they, they focus on a specific relation and uh, like has a, and they uh, frame, they, they just phrase a sentence that says, everyone knows that a bear has something and they let Roberta uh, predict words. Um, so what they found is that um, they, they had low correlation with the human elicited properties, but it's not necessarily because the properties that the model predicted were incorrect. Um, they were uh, mostly verifiable by humans. Like if they gave it to humans, humans would say, yes, it's, it's correct. Uh, but it probably comes to say that um, maybe it's not the most prominent properties that, or it's just not the same properties that humans would think of when you show them a bear and you, or you show them the word bear and you ask them to list properties. Okay, so, so far we've seen pretty positive evidence that language models contain uh, knowledge, uh, but now um, we want to ask whether we can trust the knowledge from language models. This connects to that question on whether if, if it was in the corpus, then the models should really know it very well. Um, and here's a counter example. This is just an anecdotal example because it's from a uh, paper currently under review. Um, so if you give Bert, Bert a sentence like the color of the dove who was sitting on the bench was mask um, and you ask it for a substitute of mask, then it knows that it should be a color name there. Um, it's pretty good at, um, at figuring out what should be the semantic type of, of the mask word, uh, but it doesn't predict the correct uh, color. It doesn't necessarily know the color of a dove. So instead it predicts things like red, blue, yellow, and purple. Um, and um, this is um, this is pretty expected because it's uh, some kind of generalization that it makes. It just has a very similar representation to all the colors. So, uh, or also, um, it's also a result of not being able to say, "I don't know." I haven't seen that in the training corpus. Um, there were two uh, papers recently. Actually, there were more papers. This is not. Um, uh, this is outdated, uh, but there was one paper uh, in, I think, EMNLP last year uh, that um, they were working on instilling knowledge into language models, uh, but I, I like to quote it for its title because uh, it, I think it illustrates very well uh, one of the problems with language models. So here um, you can imagine that Barack and Hillary had similar, they, they had distributionally similar uh, representations in the language model because they tend to appear in similar contexts. Uh, but the model doesn't really know how to express the specific relationship between these two entities. So instead, it just hallucinates something that's incorrect. There's also an example of uh, syntactic generalization gone wrong uh, from uh, ACL this year uh, that says that uh, models like BERT can predict with high uh, confidence that birds cannot fly or any other negations of correct facts. Uh, and there were two other papers in ACL that also um, showed that. Um, okay, so we've seen a positive and negative example. Uh, now the question that we're asking is whether this data is, this um, knowledge is useful or not. So uh, we're gonna exemplify that it is useful um, through um, zero-shot language model-based models for common sense tasks. So um, zero-shot means we're not train it, training it, so we're only relying on the knowledge gained during, during pre-training. Um, the setup for zero-shot models, um, we're talking about uh, multiple choice models. So it's usually as follows. Uh, you have some context or a question uh, here. It's just going to be the answer is, uh, and you have a list of answer choices. So you could just uh, assign the answer choice or concatenate the answer each each answer choice into the context, and then um, you can you have these statements and you use the language model to score all these statements. So we are assuming that the um, 
the better the language model score or the um, lower the cross entropy loss, um, the, the more plausible a statement is. And then predicting the answer choice with the best language model score. Um, so this is pretty standard. Uh, you could also do that with a mass language model, but it's more straightforward when um, the answer choice is a single token. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a specific work from our group. This is uh, currently on archive. Um, it's called um, uh, Unsupervised Common Sense. Wait, wait. <laughs> I'm hiding my, uh... okay, you can see the title. I'm, I'm hiding it with your, uh... um, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, something with self-talk. And uh, what we ask here is um, whether uh, we can use pre-trained language models to generate what, what is otherwise uh, implicit knowledge for um, common sense tasks. Uh, so we slightly modify the, um, the zero-shot model. Um, now we have an additional input. So we have the main question or the context, uh, the answer choices, and we have a list of clarifications, which I would explain, I will explain in the next slide. Um, so here's an example from uh, Common Sense QA. Uh, the question is, what do professors primarily do? And the answers, uh, we're just showing two out of five here, just for the sake of simplicity. Um, the answers are uh, either teach courses or wear wrinkled tweed jackets. Uh, the correct answer should be teach courses, if, if anyone has a doubt. Um, and we also have a list of clarifications. So here, uh, again, we're only showing two. Uh, one of them is the main function of a professor's teaching career is to teach students how they can improve their knowledge. And the other one is uh, the main function of a professor's teaching career is to provide instruction in the subjects they teach. Um, so what we do here is uh, we concatenate the, the question with the, or the context uh, with uh, each answer choice and each clarification. So we, overall, we get four statements and we score each one of them with the language model and predict the answer choice uh, that whose statement um, yields the best language model score. Or it's sometimes easier to think about it as a two-step process in which we first choose for each answer choice the most supportive clarification and then we predict the answer choice that gets the better language model score. So how do we generate the clarifications? Um, that's why we call it self-talk because we generate it with the language models. So we basically just let uh, the language models um, converse with each other and we don't panic and shut down our uh, model. Um, and so um, for a question like what do professors primarily do, we uh, form a clarification question uh, from a list of, we have a list of prefixes, uh, which I'm not going to elaborate on, but uh, it's in the paper. Um, and so we uh, fit this into a language model. Here, for example, it would be uh, distilled GPT-2. And um, it generates the continuation uh, a professor's teaching career. We then take the uh, main question, the clarification question that we generated, and the answer prefix, which would be the main function of a professor's teaching career is, and we fit it into the uh, model and it generates the continuation. So overall we get the main function of a professor's teaching career is to teach students how they can improve their knowledge. Um, so as baselines, we, first of all, we have the zero shot model with no clarifications, uh, but we also have baselines with uh, clarifications uh, obtained from different sources. Um, so I'm going to exemplify it with an instance from um, Social IQA, it's a different data set. Um, so for example, here the context is uh, Taylor was doing her job, so she put the money in the drawer. And uh, we also have a question, we're gonna see it uh, later. So the th first thing we can do is something that's pretty standard, um, which is to use ConceptNet, um, again, um, common sense knowledge base, and just look for paths connecting any pair of words in the context or the question. So for example, uh, job and money uh, would yield the following subgraph. And uh, when we translate it into natural language, we get job is a type of work, you would work because you want money. Uh, similarly, we could also look for uh, joint occurrences of job and money in a corpus, uh, specifically Google engrams. We get something like job to earn money. It's not necessarily a complete sentence, but sometimes as 
In this case, it's indicative of the relationship between job and money. Uh, we also have a question associated with this instance, which is what will Taylor want to do next? And um, here we use comment, which I'll um, hopefully, if we have time, I'm, I'm going to talk about in, in depth. But um, it's a language model trained on a knowledge base. It's sort of like a knowledge base completion uh, uh, model. And uh, we can simply ask it this question, what will someone want to do next? And uh, it says that Taylor wants to keep the money in the drawer. So all of these are baselines. Um, so overall, we found that um, you improve the performance if you use language models generated clarifications uh, as opposed to not using any clarifications. So this knowledge, although uh, noisy, is helpful. Uh, we also found that it works as well as knowledge extracted from uh, Comet, ConceptNet, and Google Engrams, uh, again, despite being more noisy. And, uh, but interestingly, when we asked people to judge the clarifications that were, that the model considered as helpful, uh, people didn't actually consider them as helpful for, for it's not part of the reasoning pro process they were doing to answer the question. Um, so they, they did say that it was um, um, relevant to the context or to, to the main question. And um, about half of the times they considered it is as factually correct. Uh, but maybe like 20% of the cases, depending on the task and the model, um, they considered it as helpful, which was surprising to us. But I guess it, it says that um, these models are solving it in a different way than, than we are solving these, answer, these questions. Um, questions so far on this part? Okay. So, um, so we talked about, um, about using these models out of the box. And now um, if we look at the um, leaderboards, then we see that the top entries, these are common sense leaderboards. We see that the top entries are uh, language model based models, but they're all supervised. So they're all fine tuning the language model. Um, so the fact that language models are in the top of the leaderboards is uh, partly due, due to uh, being a good basis for uh, common sense task model because as I've just shown, uh, they do contain a lot of knowledge. Um, but they do need fine tuning because they, they need to be trained to do the specific, to perform the specific task that uh, the, these leaderboards are testing. Uh, but you could also claim that uh, what we're doing here is we're basically just training a very large model on a very large data set. So it's obvious that they're going to be good. Uh, and the answer is probably somewhere in between. So it's, it's both these things are important. So now we're going to talk about fine tuning uh, language model for common sense tasks. Um, so here are some uh, conclusions from uh, papers from the last years. So, or from the last maybe two years. So language models pick up on lexical cues. Um, they don't like actually solve common sense reasoning. Um, there is a um, nice estimate from the Hellaswag paper from last year um, that it would take a very long time, uh, 100k GPU hours for language, model, for, for language models to reach human performance on the data set if no algorithmic advance is made. Um, this paper is from last year, and I actually, I have to admit, I didn't bother to check what's the latest performance on this data set. It might, it might have already reached human performance. Uh, but what's interesting here in this claim, I think, is the um, part on uh, no algorithmic advances made. Because although we, we've seen many models in the last year, um, they, they're all just larger models trained on more data. None of them are... are um, very different from the previous ones. I don't think there was a major algorithmic advance. Um, there's also um, the physical um, uh, common sense uh, data set. They uh, say that language models lack an understanding of basic physical properties of the world. And uh, we've seen this, um, this claim before, uh, uh, language models lack perceptual knowledge. Um, so overall, we can see that the knowledge in language models is not enough. Um, the last paper in this section uh, that I want to mention is a paper from Talmor et al, um, which tested Bert and Roberta on uh, how well they can be taught symbolic reasoning. So um, they just 
they have several tasks and they cast everything as um, multiple choice tasks and they fine tune these models to, um, to solve them. Um, so one of the interesting tasks that, I, um, uh, that they have is um, the always never task. So given an um, effect like a chicken has horns, the model needs to determine whether this fact is true always, never, or something in between. And uh, both Bert and Roberta were pretty bad on this task. Uh, and this is not very surprising. Uh, it could probably be attributed to reporting bias, which we will talk about several times today. Um, but in this context, what it means is that uh, language models were trained on text and text usually describe things that do happen or things that did happen, things that are plausible, as opposed to enumerating everything that, that didn't happen or that is not plausible in the world. Uh, so they're not very good in, at knowing what, what is not plausible. Uh, overall, they found that uh, Roberta performed better than Bert. Um, that models performed worse when they needed to make several uh, intermediate steps and compose them. And that these models are very sensitive to small changes in the input. This is also a conclusion that several papers uh, in the last few months have stated. Um, if I can put a comment in that, that remark that the model um, uh, emits uh, something that is possible, mm -hmm. um, this is interesting because it means that if we even synthetically create data sets that talk about implausible things, we can maybe greatly refine the accuracy about the implausible stuff and maybe also about the plausible things more, um, just synthetically, just because of this property. Yeah. Um, is it true? Is it like a... um, Yeah, it's, it's possible. But I think the main, I mean, I, I don't remember any specific work that did that. I think it would be interesting to try. Uh, I think the main problem is that it's um, uh, infinite. I mean, I, yeah. so many things that can't happen, that, yeah, that are not plausible. Uh, in, in, in early AI, it was referred to as the frame problem because there are um, uh, so many things that you can, um, you need to state about the, 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 you need to mention about the state of the world and uh, what's relevant and what's not relevant to a given situation. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it, it's might be, it might be an interesting direction. Yeah, and, and by the, another comment about this, yeah, it's a very infinite like scope of things that are impossible, but then you can do another thing. You can try to figure out what's implausible, but is close to possible. Like in a sort of maybe even an adversarial way, and then you have even yeah. yeah well, we actually have, be curious have to some, see it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have some slides uh, mentioning that in the context of creating benchmarks. Okay. Uh, it might be relevant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So to sum up this part, um, so we we saw that pre-trained language models contain some common sense knowledge. Uh, it is far from being an exhaustive source. Um, this insufficient coverage is often a result of reporting bias. Um, which means that things that are either implausible or uh, too trivial are never mentioned in text. Um, the, I think the more serious problem is that um, language models also generate false facts. So this insufficient precision is something that we should be aware of. Uh, these are the references for this part. I can share the slides later if you're interesting, interested. Uh, okay. Yeah, please, please do. Uh, when you share them, I also post it on the Reddit so everybody has access. Sure. Okay, so moving on to common sense benchmarks or how, we, how can we measure uh, that our model is actually doing some common sense reasoning. Um, so uh, we could do that with um, just observing the behavior, but we're more interested in the other way now, which is um, um, constructing specific benchmarks to uh, to test them on uh, knowledge specific tests. Um, and usually this would be done in the form of a question answering format or like multiple choice um, uh, format because it's easy to evaluate uh, with accuracy. Um, there are some, a few tasks that are generative, uh, but they're very hard to evaluate because we don't really have good um, automatic methods for generation. Um, so most tasks are um, QA. Um, so these are sort of like steps to creating a benchmark. So we first need to determine the type of reasoning we're interested at. Uh, here, is just, here are just a few examples from the um, uh, LNN AI leaderboard. 
so it could be something like uh, abductive reasoning. This is a type of um, logic. Um, it could be visual common sense reasoning. This is a data set with uh, an image and some common sense questions on, on, these, on this image. Um, we're focusing on social IQA for the sake of uh, demonstration. So this is a data set that deals with social situations and reasons about, about what happens in these situations. So for example, um, Alex spilled food all over the floor and it made a huge mess. Uh, and then the question would be, what will Alex want to do next? Um, so it could either be that Alex would want to run around in the mess or mop up the mess. And it's very easy for us to tell that the letter is the correct one. Um, this is based on Atomic, which I would mention later. Um, uh, so um, the questions uh, refer to one of nine uh, dimensions. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it in, uh, later. Um, so another decision we need to make when we create a benchmark is how large it's going to be. Uh, most recent benchmarks are large scale, so they also contain a training set um, that can facilitate training neural models. Um, and it's usually crowdsourced uh, in order to gather a lot of data. Um, earlier, earlier, I hear I some, hear some echo. Echo. I think somebody logged in and that their speaker was on, but it should be okay now. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, earlier uh, data sets were usually small scale uh, created by experts um, and often just provide data uh, dev and test sets. Um, here are two examples. Uh, the Winograd schema challenge um, is a pronoun resolution task. So uh, for example, a sentence like, the city councilman refused the demonstrators a permit because they advocated violence. Um, so the task here is to determine whether they refers to the city councilman or the demonstrators. Um, syntactically, it could be either, but uh, semantically, we know that here uh, they refer to the uh, demonstrators based on our common sense. Uh, what makes this task uh, in particular hard um, is uh, that every such sentence has a twin sentence with a minimal uh, modification that um, has the, the opposite answer. Uh, so here, if we change advocated to feared, uh, now they refers to the city councilman. Um, it's not, I mean, uh, today um, models already achieved uh, close to or maybe even better than human performance, I don't really remember. Uh, but it's unfortunately not really due to solving the task, but more due to gaming the task. That's, that's one of the problems we have. Um, and the other example is COPA, which is... Uh, um, maybe I'll ask, what, is, what does it mean, gaming the task? Oh, um, I, I have something about it in a few slides. If, <laughs> if it doesn't answer your question, then uh, ask me again. Um, the other task is the choice of plausible alternatives, uh, COPA, which has a sentence, uh, like I hung up the phone, and uh, it asks about either ca the cause or the effect. And uh, so here, for example, the cause would be that the caller said goodbye to me. Um, yeah, so one of the challenges is whether we want to collect both positive and negative answers or just positive answers and somehow randomly sample the negative answers. Uh, we want the negative answers to be plausible, but unlikely. We don't want them to be too easy. If we just randomly sample, it might be too topically different. Um, so one thing that we could do is we can ask crowdsourcing workers to um, also give us negative answers. So for example, for a question like, what will Alex want to do next? Um, we can ask workers to say, what will Alex want, want, want to do next? Um, what will Alex not want to do next? Um, and so, uh, for example, they can say that uh, leave the mess or run around in the mess, which seems fine to me, but um, models uh, actually identify some artifacts here and um, making it too easy to detect. And, and that's like one type of gaming that the models just um, pick up on some differences in the distribution that are not really uh, related to the task itself. So for example, um, people, crowdsourcing workers, they um, 
not deliberately because they're, they're not doing a good job, job or something like that, but when they're asked to perform a test, they would uh, often try to uh, come up with a strategy that is uh, less cognitively difficult to do. And so they just uh, have this very specific pattern or, of providing negative answers, giving the positive answers. And then um, they might do something like uh, exaggerate or go off topic or become overly emotional. And then models can very easily pick up on these clues and achieve superhuman performance on data sets, but they're not actually solving the underlying task. They're just um, identifying some kind of style uh, that is unique to incorrect answers. Uh, so this is called annotation artifacts. There were many papers on that in the last few years. Uh, we still haven't solved that, um, but there are some strategies to try to create data sets that are uh, free of annotation artifacts. Um, I'm going to talk about two of them. One of them is modified answer collection and the other one is adversarial filtering. Can so, I ask something here because I, I think yeah, it's sure. important. Um, um, I mean, you say uh, you, you don't give any context of um, yeah. there are a guy who did the mess and uh, he can also call a server, right, to, to, to clean the mess. This is also a possible answer. Yeah. But it, this is never tested because you don't give the context in which the situation takes place. You, you, you assume a general context and uh, then ask a question related to that. But the, the context itself, this is not normal because there could be various situations. So he can make the mess because he was arguing with something, so somebody. Yeah. So he did it intentionally. He can be a boss and call a server. So the, it seems to me that there are some, uh, some assumptions here for this task that are not, um, are not specified. Yeah, th that's a very good point. Uh, the context is limited. Um, the question is about the more plausible uh, outcome and um, the fact that it's a multiple choice task makes it a bit more reasonable because uh, you only need to um, to pick the answer that might be that that is the most reasonable one. The other ones should be completely incorrect. Uh, if it was a generative task, I think it would be reasonable if a model generated something like call a server to clean up. Um, but then you would have to to have some way to evaluate it. And usually, what we would do is human evaluation. Um, but yeah, it's, it's obviously limited. We have to limit the scope of the, of the data set. But, but that's a very good point. Maybe it's a good time. I want to add a remark for anybody who's also going to watch this recording. In all machine learning tasks, especially in text, but everything, um, defining the benchmark and making sure that the benchmark is right and is accurate, many times is the, is the biggest problem. Many times this is the hard thing to tackle. It's the same also in vision and in uh, signal processing, because you can say um, there are good results for the neural net or, or whatever, but what is a good result? How do you measure good? Um, and it's important that you're touching this here. Um, this is, uh, again, for anybody who's gonna watch this recording, this is important anytime you practice anything with statistics or machine learning. Yeah, it's, it's a general problem um, in, in machine learning in general, but specifically in NLP, I know, uh, not just in, um, in common sense tasks. In general, we have this problem that now um, we create data that is somewhat artificial because we ask people to generate text for us. And then uh, we uh, train very large models that are capable of um, finding these statistical patterns that are in no way indicative of the actual task. Uh, and then it's hard to prove that they're not, then, then you have all these popular media reports that say uh, superhuman performance on this task and, and that's that task. And exactly. It's, hard, uh, it's really hard to show that these models are not actually doing any kind of reasoning. Exactly. Sometimes, yeah, you can see research that is more like a bit of maybe even, it's a harsh thing to say, but maybe a bit more clickbait than it is real oh, concrete results. Huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's very, it, it, it's very important to uh, develop this critical approach to uh, reports on new uh, models. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about two approaches to um, try to create more robust data sets. I'm, I'm going to uh, mention again that it, this is still 
uh, ongoing research, these are not perfect uh, solutions. So one of them, again, in the context of social IQA would be um, instead of asking people to generate the negative answers, you could just take positive answers for related questions. So if we also ask people about what, uh, what did Alex need to do before this, and they answer something like have slippery hands or get ready to eat, uh, then we can take these answers and use them as negative answers for what will Alex want to do next. And what we gain here is that these are topically related. It's not off topic. So that's a bit better. Um, there's also an example from Common Sense QA that I've mentioned earlier. Um, this is built on top of, um, of uh, the knowledge base concept net. And so if it's asking, it's focusing on um, specific concept at, at each instance. So for example, if the context is house and it's asking about, um, I don't know, about some, some kind of relationship to house, then, okay, maybe it's confusing. It's asking about some uh, relationship to a target concept and then uh, it's taking other concepts that are in a different relationship uh, as destructors. So again, staying on topic, but um, making something that's related, uh, negative, negative answers that are related, but are not the correct answer. That makes it more difficult. Uh, the other approach is to, um, dur to do, um, during the collection of data, um, you do that in an iterative approach that you uh, collect examples and then you, um, uh, you at each step you train some, um, uh, not not a very strong model, but you you train some model to uh, predict the the um, uh, instances that you collected, and then you remove the easy examples, the ones that the model can solve, um, and then what you end up is with uh, robust examples. Um, there are some problems in this approach. Uh, one of them is that it's costly because you have you end up throwing away many annotations. Uh, the other one is that it doesn't, it's not, um, it's only good until the next model comes out and maybe detects other artifacts that your previous model removed, uh, previous model failed to remove. And the last thing is that it's also making the task um, artificially harder than it should be because what we actually want to do is remove spurious patterns or exploitable artifacts we don't actually want to remove the easy examples because if the task is has some kind of distribution of um, difficulty of the examples, we want to keep it. And this makes it very difficult. Uh, but uh, we don't really have a better solution. And you can see that at least it solves the problem of obtaining um, very good performance without solving the task. Um, specifically about social IQA, um, let's look at some examples that BERT large makes. So we have a 20% gap uh, from BERT large to humans. So for example, um, given this instance, although Aubrey was older and stronger, they lost to Alex in arm wrestling. How would Alex feel as a result? So here the answer should be uh, boastful. But uh, BERT predicts ashamed, which is um, probably how uh, Aubrey would feel as a result. So um, yeah, it's not person centric. It, it's, it's good with the like topical uh, relatedness, but not specifically reasoning about specific people. Um, another example, uh, Remy gave Skylar the concierge or her, her account so that she would check into the hotel. What will Remy want to do next? So Bird here predicts uh, arrival at the hotel, so, which is the, what Remy did before. Uh, Again, this is topically related, so it's confusing for Bert. Um, this is an, um, um, a map of, the, of many uh, common sense uh, data sets, not all of them, um, pertaining to social common sense, physical common sense, temporal common sense, which I'm not talking about today, but um, if you're interested, it's in the original tutorial, and uh, common sense reading comprehension. Uh, any questions about the benchmarks before I move on? Um, hi, um, I just had a quick question. Um, there's another benchmark. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called the Eraser benchmark. It's more on uh, interpretable NLP tasks. So oh, it has yeah. like a bunch of data sets, uh, like, uh, like one of the data sets that I've kind of seen and worked with a bit. 
is like the movies data set, which is like uh, movie reviews and the sentiment. Mm -hmm. And there's also another additional part where the, the, there's also the rationale attached to it. So there's uh, so based on the sentiment, there's also given like why this uh, this was the sentiment that was uh, it, it it like it classifies. So maybe do you think that could also be used to check for like a, as a common sense benchmark in some way? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've heard about this uh, benchmark. I don't know it well enough to say whether it's common sense, but yeah, there is a lot of work on explainable NLP. And um, yeah, it's somewhat overlapping with common sense because sometimes the explanations are uh, very trivial facts that we know. Um, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not talking about it uh, here. It's out of the scope of these slides. Uh, it's also very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, so let's talk about common sense research. One second. I don't know who asked the question, but it's uh, interesting. If you could send us a link in the chat even for these data sets, uh, so I could also uh, post it to everybody. Um, yeah, sure, I can, I can do that. Thank you. Okay, um, so let's look at an example uh, story. Tom's grandma was reading a new book when she dropped her glasses. She couldn't pick them up, so she called Tom for help. Tom rushed to help her look for them. They heard a loud crack. They realized that Tom broke her glasses by stepping on them. Promptly, his grandma yelled at Tom to go get her a new pair. Uh, this is a fascinating story, uh, and we can uh, get some knowledge from uh, knowledge bases, specifically ConceptNet and Atomic. Uh, we're gonna talk about them in a few minutes. Um, and we can, um, see that reading is used for glasses, um, that um, someone called Tom for help because, and then as a result, Tom will rush to help her. Uh, and that Tom broke her glasses means that Tom will want to go get her new pair. Um, we can also extend this knowledge with uh, concepts that are not in the story. Um, and it can tell us, for example, that glasses are capable of improving vision or that um, yelling is a way to express anger. Um, so um, we're going to talk about existing resources for uh, common sense knowledge. I, I'm just going to mention again that we've seen earlier that language the knowledge in language models is not enough. So we're going to try to complement it with symbolic knowledge in knowledge bases. Uh, so the most famous example would be Psych, which is um, a very large project to enumerate common sense facts uh, that has been going on for over uh, 30 years um, and it's unfortunately not publicly available. There are some versions for um, uh, that are open. Um, there's the, uh, oh, and I didn't mention, but it was created by experts. Uh, there's the Open Mind Common Sense uh, project that evolved into ConceptNet, which is crowdsourced. Um, there, are, um, there are model, there are uh, knowledge bases that are created by mining text from corpora, uh, like Nell and Webchild, and uh, Atomic, which is also crowdsourced. We're going to talk about some of them. Um, so, in order to create a common sense resource, uh, you you want to create a large resource. You want it to um, uh, be precise and useful. Um, in terms of representation, you could either store the knowledge in a symbolic way with logic form, logical forms, or you could store it in natural language. And uh, with res and I'm gonna show examples for each of these. Uh, with respect to the knowledge type, um, you could either focus on a specific domain, or you can store semantic knowledge or inferential knowledge. Let's look at some examples. So ConceptNet, I've already mentioned it before, it's very prominent in common sense reasoning research. Uh, this is a semantic knowledge, this is semantic knowledge in natural language form. So here's an example. Uh, this is the concept of reading. Um, it's a sub-event of you learn, turning a page and learning. Uh, it's uh, related to book books. Uh, the effects of reading is learning ideas and a headache. Um, reading is a type of an activity and so on. So as you can see, it's natural language. And it's, this is what we call semantic knowledge. So these are um, related terms and, uh, and um, several semantic relationships. 
Um, it's a very large knowledge base uh, consisting of millions of um, relation triplets. Uh, it's also multilingual. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, Atomic is a knowledge base that cr was created in my group. Um, it consists of inferential knowledge in also a natural language form. So, uh, and it consists of almost uh, 900k uh, triplets of reasoning about causes and effects of everyday situations. So um, every entry looks like somewhat like this. There is always person X, which is the subject, the, the agent. And uh, sometimes there's also person Y. Uh, so for example, uh, X repels Y's attack. Um, we can see um, uh, some causes. So um, that, that happened because X wanted to protect others. This is of course um, not correct in every context, but that's like, something that could be correct in certain con contexts. So that might be because X wanted to save themselves. Um, before that, this is, so these are preconditions. So before that X needed to train hard or no, need to know self-defense and so on. Um, we also have effects. So what would X want as a result? What would X feel? Uh, what would be the effect on X? Um, and then also what would be the effect on Y and so on? Uh, yeah, we can and group it um, by different categories. Uh, we also have um, the attribute, how would X be seen afterwards? So uh, X would be seen as skilled, brave, and strong, and so on. Uh, okay. So um, I've mentioned earlier that um, the knowledge could also be represented by symbolic logic. So here's an example from uh, Psych. Uh, it's not very human readable, but it is machine readable. Um, I generally think that it's it's better to represent with natural language because it's easier to collect and um, and it's easier to, uh, at least for us, to read. Uh, but there is one downside to natural language, which is, uh, or there are multiple, but one of them is that it's less expressive. So here's an example for, for a triplet from ConceptNet, gentleman located at restaurant. Um, so it's easy for us to interpret that um, as um, gentlemen could be located at restaurants. Uh, but if you um, try to convert it to a logical form, you, could, you have multiple options to interpret that. So it could be uh, there exists a gentleman which is located at some restaurant or um, uh, every gentleman is located at every restaurant at every given time and, and so on. So it's less expressive. Uh, we could also differentiate by the semantic versus inferential knowledge. So we have either um, knowledge of what, like in most resources, as opposed to knowledge of why in atomic. Uh, another option is to extract common sense from text. Um, usually what, what you would do is you would uh, parse the text into some kind of syntactic or semantic representation extract triplets out of it. So here, for example, you could have something like um, Brownback is a senator or is uh, Brownback is located in Kansas and so on. Um, and then you filter rules based on metrics. Uh, usually it would be um, based on the frequency of, of occurrences of these triplets in a corpus. Um, the advantage is that you can collect a very large knowledge base very cheaply. But the disadvantage is, um, is again, reporting bias. Uh, I've mentioned it earlier, some common sense cannot be extracted from text. Um, to name a few, um, a few things that can't be extracted, um, some things like uh, idioms like black sheep are very common in the corpus. So if you uh, want to learn the frequency of black versus white sheep in the world, uh, using a corpus would not be a good idea because there are far more black ships in the corpus versus far more white ship in the real world. Um, also, um, text tends to mention more noteworthy events, specifically if you think about news, um, news corpus, um, like the web that contains a lot of news, you would see a lot of reports about um, murders and uh, much less mentioning um, of breathing, for example. This is the original reporting bias paper um, had this really nice example that if you trust uh, corpus frequency, then you would uh, 
unfair that people murder four times more than they exhale. Um, and this relates to the last point, which is that we don't tend to talk about very trivial things like breathing. Um, and this is because uh, when we converse with each other, we assume some kind of knowledge that the other person has, and we just don't mention this knowledge because it would be inefficient. Uh, it's so trivial that it never needs to be mentioned, but then it's hard to learn it from text. Um, and the last approach is to elicit common sense from humans. Uh, it could either be by experts or um, by non-experts using crowdsourcing. Uh, questions about creating uh, uh, knowledge resources. I, maybe it's not so much a question, it's more of a remark. Mm -hmm. uh, this discrepancy between what is in real life uh, as opposed to what's in text. Um, uh, you know, like thinking of how is it possible to tackle this. So nowadays with VR and AR where people are going around with goggles where they see the world and they talk. So if you can combine, I don't know if anybody's working on this. I don't know how important this type of work is right now in the research, but It'll be interesting to see. Is there any research about it, like the combination of, of video, image, and, and text? Yeah, yeah, it's an it's a excellent comment. There is some uh, ongoing research on learning common sense from multiple modalities, so uh, videos and images as well, yeah. Which would you say is a good place to start from if somebody wants to dive into this field? Um, there is the visual common sense reasoning data set that I've mentioned earlier, the VCR. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is also some work on visual birth. I think there were multiple visual birth models in the last year. Um, I think it's still um, uh, research in pretty early stages. Not a lot of people are working on that, but it's it's uh, something that a lot of people are talking about. Especially, there was a paper um, in um, this ACL that um, talked about how we can't really. Um, well, it wasn't exactly about that, but they said that we can't really learn meaning or uh, or world knowledge from text alone. So it's something that a lot of people are talking about, but it's also not very trivial. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I'm sending here on the chat, just uh, if you could look at these two links, that if they're the relevant ones to what you just mentioned. Um, yeah, I would have um, a comment related to this. Um, I mean, what you have presented here is what Psych had, had tried to do, right? So yeah. they, they have uh, extracted also knowledge from text, but they put a lot of people to input uh, common sense knowledge and then, then transform it in first order logic and some model logic. And they had theories yeah. of the world, physical theories. So um, you, you didn't talk about this, but it seems that, I mean, this is known. This was done, was tried, and it failed. Psych failed to, to reach its goals, yeah. uh, despite some, some uh, great performances in question answering at the time. But I mean, what's the, um, the step ahead? How should we move on? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I agree. I, I mean, it's, it's something that um, it's been talked about a lot, that Psych uh, invested a lot of money and effort and uh, years into building, enumerating all the common sense in the world. Um, they also have a common sense engine, uh, inference engine. So they, they weren't planning to enumerate everything, but also to infer some things. Uh, but yeah, what I've mentioned here is first of all, uh, also different approaches to collecting common sense, not just using ex experts. Uh, but also, yes, it's, it's a very good comment. We can't really enumerate everything. That's why we're also building models. And this is actually good um, a good um, comment to lead me to the last section, which is how to combine these uh, knowledge bases with models, with neural nets. Okay, um, I don't know if I'm gonna have time for all of these sections, or maybe I'm just gonna skip some things here. Um, so starting with an example from uh, the Winograde data set, this is the large scale version of the Winograde schema challenge. So here uh, it's no longer a pronoun resolution task, but instead there is a blank. We need to fill it with one of the, with one of two options of uh, previously mentioned entities. So for example, Katrina had the financial means to afford a new car, while well, Monica did not, since one of them had a high paying job, it should be Katrina. Um, the standard way to solve this task today would be to fine tune a language model. 
So it's very, it's a pretty standard uh, input setup. You have a uh, special beginning token like CLS. You have the context, which here would be Katrina had the financial means to afford a new car, while well, Monica did not since. Um, then you have a separator and you have each one of the uh, answer candidates separately. So for example, Katrina had a high paying job or Monica had a high paying job. You uh, fit this into uh, mm -hmm. BERT, for example, um, and then it goes into a classifier that predicts an answer choice, uh, an answer score for each of these answer choices. And you also train it to update the BERT weights. So that's really standard. Um, fine tuning is very important. Here's an example of what you get if you just use BERT out of the box. Uh, we can't use exactly the same input setup, but what we do here is just um, mask the, the um, uh, underscore and then we uh, ask it for substitutes for, for this. So it's uh, among the top five predictions, it tells us that Monica is the correct answer. It's obviously not just limited to the two options, which is Katrina and Monica, it's predicting out of all of Bert's vocabulary, but among the five top predictions, we only see Monica, which is incorrect. Um, alternatively, you could also look for knowledge about these um, concepts that are mentioned in the context in uh, ConceptNet. So here you can see that job is used to make money, uh, spending money requires making money, buying requires spending money, uh, car is something you can buy, and it's capable of costing you a lot of money. And um, I want to argue that some um, knowledge is missing here. Uh, specifically, I would like to see that a high paying job is a type of a job, uh, specifically one that is used for making a lot of money. Uh, arguably, if you want to spend a lot of money, you need to earn a lot of money. And um, then you can buy something that costs a lot of money and car is one of these things. And you might also want to remove this edge so you can only get to car from buying something that costs a lot of money. And assuming we have this knowledge, we can then take this graph and then also take some vector uh, representation of the context and um, give it to some model that can extract knowledge from either one of these sources. So this is the general schema. Um, what we're talking about right now is static integration of uh, knowledge from knowledge bases into neural nets. Um, so we're going to see a very simple recipe that consists of uh, four, four ingredients. The first one is the task. So what, what we're going to, uh, what, what are we trying to solve and uh, what kind of knowledge that, is, that this task uh, requires. The second is the knowledge source. So where are we getting our symbolic knowledge? The third is the neural component. And the fourth, which is I think the most interesting one is how to combine these two. It's not trivial. Um, so with respect to the task, I've already mentioned a bunch of tests, uh, so I'm going to skip that for the sake of uh, time, but I do want to mention uh, Rock Story. This is uh, one task that is very commonly addressed. Um, so here, given uh, the beginning of a story with four sentences, um, the task is to determine which of the two given endings is the correct one. Uh, with respect to the knowledge source, so there are plenty of options, but uh, the vast majority of papers uh, use only ConceptNet. Uh, and it's, it happens because ConceptNet is very extensive. It's not, I don't have any negative things to say about it. Uh, other knowledge sources include uh, other knowledge bases, um, such as Atomic that we've mentioned earlier. Um, you could also mine knowledge from text. Uh, one thing that's uh, commonly mined from text is uh, something called script knowledge. So script knowledge is given um, a global event, like going to a restaurant, um, is uh, stating the sub-steps or sub-events uh, in order of this event. So for example, um, sitting at the table, uh, reading the menu, ordering, eating, paying, and leaving. Or um, I'd like to say that now this script has changed and we also need to uh, take off the mask and uh, sanitize the hands. Um, and finally, we can also use tools. So uh, things like knowledge base embeddings. These, these are um, tools that were trained on knowledge bases. So knowledge base embeddings or um, sentiment analysis models, reference resolution models, and so on. Uh, the neural component is the, the easiest part, I would say, because you would usually just use the latest um, uh, neural architecture that everybody's using. Um, so until two years ago, it was just by LSTM with attention. 
And now it's just fine tuning a language model. Um, this is the interesting part. So how to combine these two? Um, so there are many options, um, but I group them into roughly three main categories. Uh, one of them is to incorporate the knowledge directly into the scoring function. The other one is um, to um, convert this symbolic knowledge into some vector representation and then uh, trivially um, add it to the network. And the last one is through multitask learning. And I, I have one example for each, but I think I'm gonna skip the first one for the sake of time. This is the most complicated one. Um, okay, so this example um, is uh, from last year um, for Rock Stories and MC Script. These are both um, multiple choice tasks. Um, the neural component here is just fine tuning BERT. So, um, it, and in a pretty standard way. So here again, the context is the four, uh, the first four sentences of the story uh, and the um, um, answer candidate is each ending separately, uh, separated by a separator token. Uh, so they're just fine tuning BERT. This is the main task. Um, and then um, they're gathering knowledge from ConceptNet and they have two auxiliary tasks. So um, for a given uh, pair of words from the context and the ending, uh, such as restaurant and food, they have one auxiliary task that needs to determine with, whether these two words are semantic or, semantically or related or not. Um, and it's supervised by ConceptNet. And the other task, uh, which is more specifically asking about the semantic relation between these two words. Um, and th these two auxiliary tasks, then uh, their loss is then, then back propagating and updating the BERT weights, so eventually, um, instilling knowledge into BERT, uh, which then helps the main task. So this is an example of multitask learning. Um, and the third example um, is for common sense QA. Um, again, uh, the, the input to BERT is pretty similar. Uh, we have the question, which is where do adults use glue sticks? Um, one of the answers is office. Um, they're not immediately training uh, fine tuning BERT, but they are first um, extracting a vector representing this statement. And they're also uh, taking knowledge from concept net. So here they're taking a subgraph um, that pertains to all the um, concepts mentioned in the context and the answer, or in the question and the answer. So for example, uh, adults are capable of using glue stick uh, at an office where they work. Um, this is encoded with an LSTM with attention uh, into a graph vector. And finally, the statement vector and the graph vector are concatenated and fed into an MLP. So here it's less um, tightly uh, related, but the MLP can choose where to get the information from. Okay, this is um, that part. And I hope like in the last few minutes to um, talk about uh, why this is, why what I've mentioned, what I've shown now is limited and how do we, um, so, I talk now about static integration. I want to show why it's limited and how to improve it. Improve it. So uh, given a context like Kai knew that things were getting out of control and managed to keep his temper in check. Um, one limitation of using a knowledge graph to obtain knowledge for a specific instance is that first of all, uh, things would rarely be found as is in a knowledge graph. So if we're using atomic, for example, we're not going to find something that says exactly what our context says. Um, and the reason for that is that it's um, common sense knowledge is immeasurably vast and it's impossible to manually enumerate it. We've already talked about it earlier. And even trying to do so is very expensive and takes many years as, as we know from psych. Um, the other problem is that sometimes we can get incorrect nodes. And finally, even when we do get correct nodes, sometimes they're not completely correct in the context. So for example, here we know, we see that um, uh, X skips X's temper because they want to avoid a fight. But our context never mentioned anything about a fight. So it's probably not relevant in our context. Um, so the solution is uh, dynamic integration. And specifically what we want to do is uh, we want to train a model on the knowledge base um, to learn from the examples in the knowledge base and induce new examples. 
And in, in a simpler way, uh, we want to take a language model and we want to train it on a knowledge base, like atomic or constant. Net. So for example, if atomic has an event like a uh, person sails across oceans uh, with a relationship of requires uh, buying a boat, then we fit the head entity and the relation into a language model and we train it to predict the tail entity. So it's a structured, um, structured knowledge. We train it just like a language model. So we get a knowledge model and the advantage of this knowledge model is that now we can fit any uh, situation into it in, in a dynamic way. It's gonna um, output, um, it can, it's gonna predict an output for any situation. Uh, it's called Comet, which is uh, short for Common Sense Transformers. Uh, there is a demo online, and it's also the model is publicly available. I can link all the, I, I can uh, send all the URLs later. Later. Yeah, after the lecture, I already opened the post. Um, after that, I'll talk to you about it, and we'll take all the links and po post them there. Sure. I actually also said I don't think you saw, but I sent on the group chat here uh, the link to the post, so everybody has it. Thanks. Uh, okay. So uh, here's an example for using the Comet model trained on Atomic. So uh, person X gives a tutorial, uh, means that um, person X is perceived as smart. Uh, this is an example for my colleague. I didn't uh, do that. Um, before X needed to be a teacher, it's not, not exactly. Uh, others will want to thank person X, uh, and then others would gain knowledge. None would, would be the original prediction by Atomic. Um, from ConceptNet, uh, listen, if we train comment on ConceptNet, listening to a tutorial uh, happens in the classroom. It's motivated by being smart and starts with sitting down and, and so on. Uh, why does it work? It works because it's transferring knowledge from language to, um, to this structured model. So for example, um, uh, comment trained on ConceptNet uh, says that mango is a fruit. But if you look at ConceptNet, um, Mango is also mentioned as used for salsa. Um, and uh, if you just train the model without the, the language pre-training, if you just take, um, I didn't mention earlier, but it's trained on GPT. If you just take um, a transformer not trained on language and you train it on ConceptNet, it's going to predict that Mango is a spice. So definitely it's taking somewhere, something from the language pre-training. Uh, so does it mean that language models know that mango is a fruit? Uh, yes, it does, but you can, it really matters how you phrase the prompt. Um, so if you started with a capital letter and then uh, GPT-2 would think that it's a definition and a predict fruit. Um, same for BERT. Um, so overall we have a pre-trained language model and we um, train it on um, a knowledge base and then we can get a knowledge model. Um, I'm going to skip that because we're out of time, but uh, overall I just want to show that it's very effective because we can um, dynamically predict um, many inferences and it's been used for several downstream models pretty successfully. And uh, just a short just to briefly mention, we also have uh, now a visual common sense knowledge graph. Um, I think there is a demo for that too. I can, again, send a link later, but here uh, given a, uh, an image and um, uh, people that are um, marked in the image, it can reason about what they're doing and why they're doing. Is this open it. source? Can, can we? Yeah, I, think I need to check that it's actually publicly available uh, because I think I think it's, uh, it's pretty recent, but yeah, it should be, I think there should be a demo for it. Okay, because I know a couple of people who would like to play with this and, and do some interesting things. Sure. Um, especially, I think, in our group. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to sum up. Um, so we talked about ways to acquire, represent, and distill common sense knowledge of various types, like physical and social. I didn't mention temporal, but again, it's in the original tutorial. Uh, and in different ways. Uh, we talked about how to integrate it into models, um, either in a static way or dynamically learning a knowledge model that can generalize. And uh, we talked about how to measure common sense abilities with benchmarks. 
none of this is actually solved yet. Um, uh, it's still really work in progress. Um, and the ways forward, we don't really know, but the things we're working on is to collect more knowledge. And um, as Peter mentioned earlier, also um, maybe learning from different modalities. So combining uh, images and videos and so on. And um, none of this is actually really doing any kind of reasoning. As I mentioned earlier, we really have this problem with our models learning to game the tasks. So um, yeah, we need to somehow come up with a solution for that. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. So, so anybody who has questions, this is the time. Um, we'll, I think we'll have uh, that give us five more minutes, maybe, um, if somebody wants to ask or say something. Uh, in yeah, the meantime, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that you at, at the last at the last point is the reasoning that is missing here. So without the reasoning, we can't say we have a, a common sense system. And I know in psych, they had a lot of reasoning. They have micro theories and they had represented physical uh, theories of the world. For example, if you put a, a book uh, on the edge of the table, it might fall, things like this. So um, if you have uh, some comments here, because you let it a little bit in the void, uh, what do you think should be the way to go to, to integrate reasoning in, into these systems? Yeah, I, I don't really know what would work, but I know that some people advocate um, some combination of symbolic uh, reasoning, like in psych style with uh, uh, enumerating um, preconditions and postconditions and and, um, and learning these kind of inferences with uh, neural models. Because I know, I've, I mean, I think most people I, I, I talk with, they're more um, aware of, um, like, they're more, they're doing uh, neural um, work with uh, deep learning. And so um, I just want to point out that these models are not actually doing the kind of reasoning that we're that some people are claiming they do, or that it seems like they do. Um, but I, I know that there were, there were also issues with symbolic, um, uh, symbolic reasoning. I just personally didn't work on it because it was um, many years ago. Um, so I know some people want to combine it. Some other people say that it, they don't think it's going to work. But yeah, each one of these approaches has its advantages and disadvantages. So it's probably going to be some combination. In, in, in simple words, uh, I just I don't think deep learning based solutions would be um, a full solution for common sense reasoning. I'm, I'm, I'm very doubtful of that. But I, I'm also not sure that symbolic reasoning would be the, the missing component. Hi. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, was the previous question answered? I think so. Okay. Um, hi. So I was wondering, um, it seems like a lot of the previous work that has been done is based on, well, the model is sort of observing um, information that it's, that's already there. Um, do you see any sort of um, place for models kind of acting as an agent in a situation? Um, with these common sense tests? Yeah, so I, I think it's a very good direction. I think that's what we were partly trying to do in the in, in a very like simple, very simplistic way in the self-talk model that I presented. We were trying to have the model actively ask for clarification questions to gain more knowledge on things that are not explicitly mentioned in the context. Uh, but yeah, I think maybe, um, it, it could definitely be um, improved by having um, maybe either like uh, having some active learning or asking people to have a human in the loop or or some kind of reinforcement learning or there, there are m multiple dimensions in which it can be improved. And also, uh, I don't know if that's what you were referring to, but maybe having like uh, an, um, uh, an agent in the real world, like a something with uh, embodied um, like a robot that walks somewhere and gets instructions and things like that. I think I know people are working on that. Um, 
but yeah, all of this is very hard. <laughs> very cool. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? Um, yeah. I uh, just to add on to that last question, like I was also like uh, kind of thinking along those same lines of uh, like having some sort of an em embodied agent in some environment, like learning representations. And you mentioned that some people are already doing some work. So maybe if you could point us towards some resources that you know. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's not, it's not, I don't think it's common sense work. I don't think anyone is working on common sense uh, with embodied agents, but I do know that um, there's a team at, at AI2 that does um, um, does vision work with uh, agents and, and other other teams as well. I can I can get some references later. I was thinking like maybe like for example um, like for, for, for like uh, let's say the physical Q and A um, like uh, to learn physical concepts. I think uh, a, a robot in the real world could probably. Uh, get some understanding of the concepts of gravity and those sorts of things. Yeah, I know someone who is, uh, I, I think, planning to work on, on it in the future, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Barry, thank you so much. This, is, uh, this was really interesting. Um, and good questions from the audience here. Daniel and I were talking on the back. He's like, oh, this audience is asking interesting questions and for sure. So thank you everybody again for the participation. Again, I sent a link to the post that will have all the references that we already discussed and the rest that after this, after the call there, then I will add. Um, I'm going to send now also again, the things I said at the beginning of the talk, which is where you can find us. Um, I really encourage everybody who, who has questions, who has knowledge in these fields, really post on our group and on the Discord and share the information that you have. On another note, I am always looking for interesting uh, teachers and lecturers and researchers to come and, and give talks. We already have four more lectures planned. A lot of them are about, by the way, our generative networks. Um, but still, I'm always looking. So if anybody knows of anybody who has interesting knowledge to share, uh, let me know. Uh, let's make something happen. Um, I don't know. I don't think I missed anything. Let me know if I missed talking about something. But uh, again, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so is this, is this presentation going to be shared somewhere? Yeah, this will be on the YouTube channel. I also posted. And it's also on, on Verit's team. They have a list of presentations about this topic, several of them. You can see it on the on the event page. Even now there's the link there. But this specific presentation will be also on our YouTube channel. And you have the channel already posted. I just posted it on in my message in the group. And I also posted once I upload it, I will post it on the Reddit and the Discord and the okay. newsletter. So you can you know follow all of them and you'll get it. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everybody's having resp nice responses here. Thank you all. Thank you for the words. Yeah. Very cool stuff. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Verit, and, and thank you, uh, Peter, for organizing this. Yeah, thank you.